We have joining us this afternoon, Tucker Carlson. He is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Daily Caller, as well as uh, having uh, done a stint on TV, as well as being a, well, regular at Fox News. And with that, Tucker, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us, sir. Oh, are you kidding? Thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right. Full disclosure before anybody brings this up. Yep. He has one of our one of our staffers. I, I, I got to be kind. Really a, a sharp young man, uh, Vince Colonnese, who's uh, sort of handling some things there for the uh, Daily Caller, where he is the executive editor. And of course, Vince, having worked for us for over a year and a half here and then moving to Washington, D.C. to initially take a pay cut. Tucker, I, I I was I tried to convince him, but he took a pay cut. But since then, things seem to have moved well for him. So thank you for uh, taking yeah. care of him. I would say he started working for me at the lowest level in the office as like an overnight, overnight. editor. Yeah. yeah, I'm not even sure I was precise on his name. And he <laughs> rose. He didn't know anybody. It's not like he had any connections of any kind. Unlike a lot of people in journalism, his parents were not journalists, and he just rose purely by skill, native intelligence, and hard work to run the site. What about all that knowledge and, and experience we gave him here at the talk stage? No, no. Oh, that's totally, oh and, well, that's true. And that's, I mean, he has talked about you. I'm not making this up every month since he started working here. He's a sharp young man, and it's a real pleasure to talk to him from time to time. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the compliment, but also thank you very much for giving him an opportunity. It's a great asset for the world of journalism. And uh, as a matter of fact, let's start with that. Let's start about the Daily Caller. And I do recall when he was working as an overnight editor, going in at, as I recall, eight o'clock in the evening and returning home about eight o'clock in the morning. He'd call me uh, on his way home. But let's talk about the Daily Caller. What precipitated this? Uh, You uh, and others have gotten involved in this. How did this come about? Well, um, it happened after the 08 election. I worked at MSNBC before it became the Leon Trotsky channel. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a show there, and then I was fired right after the election because the channel obviously changed and became left-wing, which I am not. <laughs> and at that same moment, my college roommate and best friend and neighbor in Washington, Neil Patel, was ending his eight years working for Dick Cheney in the White House. We basically were unemployed and pushing 40. We were mad about the media coverage of the 08 election, and we thought, this is a perfect convergence. We don't have anything to do, and the media are disintegrating, so why don't we start an alternative? So we did, and uh, raised some money, and built this business. We're not, we're a for-profit, we're a company, Mm -hmm. and uh, we have about 50 employees. It's worked, and it's just been a, it's just been a tremendous time. We hire mostly young people, intense, um, I want to hire I don't screen for politics necessarily. I'm not asking who you voted for, but I want people who are not conventional in their outlook, who are Mm open-minded, who don't buy into the normal cliches in the media, and who are ferociously aggressive and hardworking. We pay very bad salaries. I'm with you, so don't feel badly. (laughs) Yeah, well, we do, but we we offer, well, first of all, we buy free Pop-Tarts, a couple hundred bucks worth of Pop-Tarts and beer for everyone every week, but we also um, (laughs) pay a percentage of the revenue you generate through traffic, so some of our guys actually make a really good living here, mm-hmm. and it's it's worked. Anyway, it's worked. We have a great office. Vince runs it day to day. Does a wonderful job. He's the single best headline writer I've ever met in 25 years. My 25th year in journalism. I've never met anybody who can write a headline as clever as he can. It's it's unbelievable. I want to get to the age issue here in a moment, but related to your comment about journalism and the fact that. Folks are consuming their news in a different fashion than they used to. Not only are they doing it on the Internet, but because of the 24-hour news feed constant, it requires that hook, that item that will make it stand out. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, you mentioned the, the headline writers. This goes back 100 years in the newspaper business, the tabloids. They needed that headline because a lot of people are not aware of this, but in New York, for example, there were easily five, seven, even as many as 12 daily newspapers in the in New York City environment. So you needed that e- headline. Each running multiple editions. I mean, exactly. each paper would print three or four editions a day. And so looking at that, how has this changed the way, for example, we as consumers are reading and seeing the news? Uh, are, we, are we being forced to, uh, if you will, think faster 
and uh, consume more? Or is it a matter of we're just challenging what has been the traditional concept of uh, news and news coverage? Well, in some ways, we've reverted back to an earlier version of journalism. The landscape more resembles 1910 than it resembles mm-hmm. 1980. I mean, the news business, as you know, kind of consolidated in the last half of the last century. You had all these joint operating agreements, and basically big city newspapers had monopolies where they got all the advertising, all the classified advertising, all the you know advertising from department stores, from car dealers, and they were printing money. As you know, I worked for one uh, for a while in the early 90s, and they were just lucrative by definition. That all collapsed because of the Internet and probably some other reasons. Um, and what you have now is a much broader diversity of news sources than you had right. 20 years ago. Much broader, much, much broader. I mean, when I got into journalism, I, you know, I wanted to write night cops at the Washington Post. There just weren't that many options. And now, you know, there are a million places you could write. Um, what's changed, I think, is, is people's attention span is more fleeting. I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that spending, you know, 15 hours a day staring at your smartphone screen does something to the way mm-hmm. you read and the way that you think. I mean, I, we don't really know what it does because there aren't any good studies on it, but but it's obvious that it affects people's ability to maintain a sustained train of thought over time. So our job, and this has always been the job of journalists, I think, is to win people over, to convince readers that they should stop and take some of their precious time and spend it on us. And, you know, that's not easy, but I I don't think, you know, we should believe readers are required to read us or we're entitled to their attention. We're not. You've got to win it, and that's okay. And, and of course, one of the primary ways of winning that attention, and, and we've got to give credit to another news source, the aggregator being Matt Drudge, and you have become a regular, and I mean the Daily Caller, and by the way, those just joining us, Tucker Carlson, editor-in-chief of the Daily Caller and one of the co-founders, along with his good friend, uh, Neil Patel, am I correct? Is it Neil? Yes, that's right. And he's joining us this afternoon for a few minutes. You know, Tucker, we're looking now at, at a marketplace that not only has changed in its consumption, but also on its in its outlook. And that's what I want to go to is, who do you see as your primary market, your primary readers for the Daily Caller? Well, I mean, our, you know, they are, um, well, it's funny. We actually do research on this, mm-hmm. and our readers are not majority Republican, believe it or not. I mean, our, most of the stuff on our site's pretty conservative, or at least very suspicious of Obama. But, you know, a plurality of our readers, or really the, the majority of our readers are either Democrats or independents. Mm-hmm. But I think it's mostly male. I mean, I think most news consumers are male. I mean, that they are. And, you know, probably over 30. Okay. Uh, Drudge, as you suggested, is a great way to get your stories read. We actually happen to have literally right this second the lead banner <laughs> headline right. on Drudge right, right. now. Yep. Future of entire Internet at stake. That's our story. By our by, one of our tech writers, but um, so Drudge has been key to that. But also, uh, social media have been huge for us. Twitter and especially Facebook. A lot of people, especially older people, get their information from Facebook, get their news from Facebook. And Vince has taken the lead in figuring out how to get our stuff on Facebook and get it read. And I think we're doing a more efficient job of that. It's I'll confess, I'm 45, so. I feel a little bit behind the curve on questions. Like, I don't go on Facebook. Facebook seems like a nightmare to me. It's filled with, like... It's a waste of time. Old, I, I, yeah, old I agree girlfriends and people you don't want no. to talk to and probably shouldn't no. be talking to, and it it's a disaster. I mean, I wouldn't go on Facebook at gunpoint, but lots of people do. I'm not criticizing them, uh, and we want to reach them. The other side of that, and, and we'll take a quick break here before we wrap things up with our guest, uh, Tucker Carlson, by the way, of the Daily Caller. By the way, dailycaller.com dailycaller.com and ignoring our relationship with the executive editor being uh, Vince Colonese I will say we check it regularly throughout the day as a matter of fact well, constant thank you. oh no constant refreshing and I do compliment you on that and by the way some in-depth news being done by your staff there at the Daily Caller I again have got to make mention of that and you have broken some significant stories that uh, have gotten attention across the country so I'm not chilling for the Daily Caller, but I'm just no, uh, stating, stating a fact. I'm just stating a fact. All right. The quick question and has to do with age. We were talking about that a few moments ago, the age of the uh, average reader. You've got a lot of young reporters on staff. 
And here's my question. You know, the assumption is that, and these are late Gen Xers, early uh, millennials, Gen Ys that are on your staff, you know, break point being arbitrarily 32 years of age. Do you find there's a different viewpoint from that age group rather than us baby boomers? I'm a baby boomer. I know it doesn't look like it, but if you look closely in your microphone, you can see that there is a few gray hairs there. But, (laughs) I mean, do you you see a different approach and uh, a viewpoint from your staff uh, that either surprised you or you were counting on? Well, I've been shocked by it. Okay. I mean, I've been completely shocked by it. I I have um, four children, one in college, two in high school, one in sixth grade. So I'm around young people, but they're my children. So they're not, you know, they don't behave around me as they would around their friends. I hadn't been in years, you know, between the ages of like, well, 30 and 40. I I just wasn't around a lot of young people at all. I was around much older people, people older than I am. And it's been amazing to spend the last five years in a newsroom full of 25-year-olds. Yes, everything is different. And the way they get along with one another is different. It's all defined by the Internet. Of course, they use the Internet for dating. They use the Internet for communicating. They, their, their world is circumscribed by the Internet. Like, mm-hmm. That's their world. It's online. And that changes the way people think. And in some ways for the better, in many ways for the worse. I mean, everything's a mixed blessing as far as I'm concerned in life. But... Um, they're coming at things from a completely different perspective than my partner and I are, for sure. And does that take some uh, readjustment in your thinking as you did it, or did you just sort of say, wait a second, this is fun, I'm not going to try to over-control it? Well, I'm a reactionary by nature, so you know anything new I'm suspicious of, of course. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I wore the same clothes I wore 25 years ago. I just don't change. I don't, I'm not into change. I think that's what happens when your parents get divorced. You resist change. But um, <laughs> I am really, I think, improved by it. Actually, it's good to have your boundaries stretched. It is. It's good to be around new ideas. And I, I disapprove of most of them, but I'm glad I know what they are. And I, and I just think it's good. I mean, especially people with my personality and my politics, I think, could very easily ossify and just get compl- trapped in 1989 or whatever year you mm-hmm. imagine it is in your head. And so it's good. Like, I hate their music, and I hate their, you know, I hate the way they're dating <laughs> rituals, and I hate all of that, but I'm, I'm just glad to see it. And I think it's made me a better, more flexible person than I would have been otherwise. In the process, as you've watched them, and they've experienced life as well, are they mellowing by any chance? Well, no, I mean, I don't want them to. I mean, I hire for intensity. I mean, there's yes. a scene in... The Old Testament, where I think it's Joshua preparing for the siege of Jericho, but I, you know, your your listeners will probably know, but he says, you know, God says, you know, get this army together, and then he he says, make half of them go home, and then take the other half and take them to the river, and the ones who drink out of their cupped hands, send them home. You want the ones who stick their heads under the water and drink like dogs, and that's exactly how I hire. I want the animals. I want people who run face first into things. I'm looking for intensity and aggression, and. And that works in journalism, and I like people like that anyway. So, um, no, they're pre- it's a pretty intense group. Wow. All right, our guest, Tucker Carlson. We've got him for just a few more moments. I want to find out what has suddenly gotten Washington in a tizzy over the comments from the mayor. Why all of a sudden are they feeling thin-skinned? Is this the original Washington that I used to know? It is kind of surprising how all of a sudden – well, we'll call them the mainstream, the traditional media, and others in politics have taken Rudy Giuliani's remarks and made it significant. And it, it fascinates me because if I am a proponent of the present administration, I would ignore it. I would simply say, who is that again? I, I, what, what, what gives? Why? Because Scott Walker is moving close to becoming the front runner in this race, and so the press, which instinctively carries water for Democrats running for office, and they do, um, saw this as a way to get at Scott Walker. You know, I mean, people say all whatever you think of what Giuliani said, probably an unwise thing to say, or and certainly if you're going to make a remark like that, better to explain yourself in some greater detail than he did, but. Whatever. It's, I mean, poli- it's politics. I, you know, my, well, yeah, but also, like, who cares? I, I mean, that, I, but that was it. I, I like Giuliani quite a bit, personally, a lot. And I think he's really smart and interesting. Whatever. I, I've said all kinds of hot-headed things over the years. I mean, it has... 
I don't know. It, it's this mentality that, you know, you said something naughty, you need to be punished by the mob now. That makes me want to throw up on myself. I just cannot even, I can't even handle it. And increasingly, that's the impulse that governs all discourse in America. Did you say something naughty? We caught you saying something naughty. Oh, who cares? To my point, I, I'm thinking it's politics. Uh, they've said of the president in past, unpatriotic. They've All of a sudden, there seems to be this fear of the re, uh, of, of that remark, and... I don't get it. I mean, you've got the issue. Well, everybody in America, is t- every normal person in America is terrified because there are landmines out there, verbal landmines. You say something one- wrong, one false word, and you lose your job. Or you're publicly excoriated on social media. And businesses, for some reason, go along with this. The, the fire chief of Atlanta was fired two right, months ago right. because he said he didn't approve of gay marriage in a book he wrote. I mean, that's like... That's like the cultural <laughs> revolution. That's scary. That you know, they're not for diversity. They're for uniformity okay. of thought, and they're going to enforce it at gunpoint. All right. Then I want to bring it all the way back before we wrap things up with you. That observation, and of course, it's I, I see that predominantly among the millennials, that 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 younger generation out there. How is the conversation in your office there when this is t- when this t- is a topic? And it's been, of course, a topic of conversation everywhere. I'm sure it's there at the Daily Caller. I'll tell you exactly what I say to everybody I hire. I say, look, I, you know, I'm 45 years old, and I'm going to say whatever I feel like saying. And I like jokes, and I, I love humor. And we're, we're going to have, we say off-color things in the office. We use profanity. People say things that are not, wouldn't be allowed in any other environment. And it's my office, and that's the way I want it, and that's the way it's going to be. And if you don't like it, you don't have to work here. And people seem shocked by that, but also relieved. Well, here's a place you can say what you really think. And if, you know, you can't be cruel to other people. I'm against cruelty. I think you should be loving and kind to people. But jokes are jokes. So lighten up, America. And there are very few places in this country where you're allowed to express what you really think and and make observations about things that are obviously true. Everyone's so terrified. But they're not terrified in my office. I'm proud to say it's like my one contribution to American life is 50 people working in an office building in Washington, D.C. can say whatever they want. And that's... You know, I'm proud of that. All right. Tucker, I know you've got other commitments. Thank you for your time this evening. Look forward to chatting with you in the future. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And again, congratulations. I do appreciate this. Thanks again. Thanks a million.